get close, start getting close to Christmas time, I think the most important thing is to start looking at who Jesus is directly. We read a lot. I love Paul's letters. I love the Old Testament. There's so many passages in the Bible I love. But I think for as we get to Christmas time, I want to make sure we're clear on just who Jesus is. Let's look in John chapter 1. Let's look in John chapter 1, starting at the very beginning. And welcome everyone out there on YouTube. Hope and pray you'll receive a blessing from this message as well. And I want to start out talking, by, talking about something that I didn't learn after growing up in church, growing up in a Bible teaching church. I didn't learn this until I was in high school until I really started reading the Bible for myself. And there might be a lot of Christians who don't know this very simple thing. We read in the beginning, in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, with He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the light was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So first off, what do we see about Jesus in this very, very early in this chapter? The Word was God. First off, yes, this is something we've all been taught, and I hope we all know. Jesus is very much God. He's not a small God. He's not a different God. He is God. He was God in the flesh when he came to this earth. He wasn't diminished in his abilities at any time when they crucified him. He could have stopped him. When the high priest insulted him, he could have he could have instantly switched places to the high priest and put the high priest on the cross and Jesus could have been on, on the ground if he so chose. At no point did the Roman soldiers have power over him. At no point did anyone did anyone. He went willingly to the cross to pay the price for our sins. No one forced him to. No one compelled him. For all the frailties of the human body, he could have healed himself in an instant, if he so chose to. The only reason he was able to suffer like that is because he chose to for our sake. And doesn't that put his suffering in a different perspective? All the pain he was in. The Bible says he has marred more than any man. The lashes. I know, Jeff, a few months ago you gave a message just on how ravaged his body was. All the cuts. He was unrecognizable. And that takes even more so when he could have stopped it at any time. But he loved you so much that he wouldn't. Think about that the next time we put God on the back burner. The next time we think that, well, Jesus isn't as important as what else is going on in my life. He sure thought you were important. When he could have healed those gaping wounds, he could have stopped them from whipping them, and he said, no, I'm not going to do it. They need me. hard to endure that kind of a beating, even harder when you can stop it at any time. And he could have stopped it at any time. He had all the powers of God. He wasn't the junior partner in the Trinity. Secondly, there's just a, a lot of gold here just in the very beginning. Secondly, where was he when creation was being, was being made? Right in the middle of it. Yes, he was right there. He didn't come around later. He was right there during creation. He wasn't... Oh, somewhere down the road, God had this idea he's going to have a son. No, Jesus was there right then at creation. And furthermore, who was doing the creation? Jesus. Jesus. Puts all the more perspective on his suffering. He was getting beaten by his own creations. 
everyone who was whipping him, he made that person. Everyone who was spitting at him, he made that person. Everyone who was insulting him, he made that person. Every time we reject him by our sin, we're his own creations rejecting him. What love Jesus has for us. What would you do if your creations rebelled against you at every opportunity? How many of you, if you built something and it was constantly rebelling against you, wouldn't toss it out? Not Jesus. He sacrifices everything for his creations. What love Jesus has for us. What mercy he has for us. He was the one who created everyone. We read in verse 3, All things were made through him, and without him nothing that was made was made. In him was life and the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And what that comprehend means is actually overcome. The darkness could not overcome his light. One thing we need to understand in the news is there are a lot of people trying to overcome Jesus nowadays. Uh, what was it, Matt? You point out the article. Was it the Church of Scotland? Or, I think it was Ireland. Ireland. Uh, they're now forbidding their ministers from using the term Lord to refer to Jesus. In male pronouns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I want to focus specifically on Lord. What does the Bible say about Romans 10, 9, and 10 when it talks about being saved? You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So the darkness is trying to stop people from being saved. That's what they're trying to do. <laughs> oh, he's not your Lord. He's the uh, great grandpa in the sky. No, great grandparent in the sky. No, he's more than just that. He's Lord. Capital L. What does Lord and what does Lord uh, mean? If someone is your Lord, if Michael Miller is my Lord, what does that mean? I need to do when he talks. Uh, for Halo. Then I need to go play it. If he talks, if Michael Miller is my Lord, then guess what I need to do when he speaks? Listen. I need to obey. I need to listen. I need to do. The world is trying to take that away. Why is it so important to take away the lordship of Jesus? Take away the lordship, nobody's over you. Yeah. Then you can do whatever you want. You see, there's a reason Jesus came to be our Lord. Is it because he's got a power trip? No, it's because without proper management, I will screw up ten times out of ten. Guarantee it. If there was a chance to score up eleven times out of ten, I'd do that too. Without proper leadership and guidance and supervision, I will fail every single time. The only thing I've got going for me is I at least understand that principle. That without Jesus, I'm a miserable failure. Praise God for his love for miserable failures. Amen? Amen. The world is trying to overcome Jesus. They're trying to say, oh, you don't need to accept Christ to be to be saved. There are a lot of churches right now that teach that. Well, everyone's saved already. You don't need to accept Christ as Savior. And we're just talking about the attacks of churches on Christ. Don't even get started about the world's attacks on Christ. But the Bible tells us something. What cannot the darkness cannot overcome Jesus? They will try. They will attempt. But they will not be able to overcome Jesus. People have been trying to stop the gospel from being preached ever since the gospel has, in, has existed. It's still being preached. It's being preached right here. It's being preached all over the world. They will not be able to overcome. Praise God. Amen. Who's thankful for that? If, if Jesus could be overcome, then none of us would be saved. Amen. Praise God that he cannot be overcome. We read a bit about John the Baptist as we go through verses 6 through 13. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. 
I want to talk about how important that is that God keeps sending people to minister to miserable screw-ups like me. Aren't you so thankful for that? That God didn't look at us in our mess, in our muck, and say, ah, oh, they don't need a redeemer. I'm just sick of them. He sent someone to tell us. He could have easily said, I gave them the scriptures. I gave them the law. If they can't figure it out, the law wasn't written so that you had to have a PhD to understand it. They can't figure it out. Tough on them. That's not our Jesus. He keeps reaching further and further, trying to bring people out of the muck. Because that's what he does. Praise God for that. He didn't need to send John to prepare the way. He didn't need to send anyone. He didn't need to come himself. He, we didn't deserve it. But he did because he loved us. We read in verse 8, He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. What is Jesus? He is the true light of the world. Anyone else who says they're the light of the world is lying. Are there a lot of people who claim to be the light of the world? There's a lot of different religions. There's a lot of different beliefs. But the only one that has hope in the darkness is Jesus. Verse 10 we read, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own received did not receive him. The mercy of Jesus in that despite the rejection he faces, does he give up? How many of you know what it's like to be rejected by family? Jesus knows what that's like. Because he was there. He was rejected by his family. Isn't it a blessing to know that we can go to the Lord when we're feeling rejection? And he understands? Because he's gone through it. He'll be there for us, too. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So what has Jesus come to offer us? It goes beyond just a ticket to heaven. Jesus comes to say, if you believe in me, you're coming into the family. You're going to be a part of my family. What a blessing that is. Would it be enough to just say, you can come to heaven? Yeah. Yeah! But he's going a step further. We're being adopted into his own family. That's a powerful statement, being adopted into his own family. You know, when you're born into a family, you're kind of stuck with each other. You know what I mean? How many of you have relatives that you're blood relatives and you tolerate each other even though you can't get along, but you're family, so you're going to stick with each other because you're blood relatives, right? Do we all have those kind of relatives? But being adopted into a family is something, I think, more powerful than blood. Because someone saw you, and they made that choice. That, yeah, I'm not obligated, but I'm going to accept you into my family anyway. They, you, it wasn't biology that dictated your family, it was love. And it was a decision, a choice. Something That's something very powerful, that... I love you so much that I'm going to give you equal standing in my family, even though you're not a blood relative. And I'm going to treat you as an equal. That's what Jesus has done for us. He's adopted us into his family. We're now children of God. And everyone is not a children of God. We're all creations of God, but we're not all considered children. But if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're His child. 
What does he promise to his children? Will he ever leave us or forsake us? No. Praise God. We read in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's still so powerful that Jesus would come to this place and dwell among us. How many of you, if you got a chance to go to heaven today, would want to come back? Anyone? Anyone jumping at that idea? I think if we went to heaven, we'd have to get kicked out before we'd come back. But not Jesus. He came here. That's how strong his love was. That's how powerful his love was. He left paradise to come here to be cold, to be hungry, to be miserable. But because he loved us so much, it was worth it to him. What power the love of Christ has. That's the kind of love he wants us to have for one another. When he says love one another, that's what he means. How far are we willing to go for each other? What are we willing to do for each other? Are you praying for each other? We hear about some of the different requests here. Jeff asked everyone to pray for his son. Are we willing to do that? That's what Jesus would want us to do. Pray for him like he's our own family. Andrea talks about our moving issue. Are we praying about that like we're the ones that need a home? Is that how strongly we're praying for that? It needs to be. If we're honest, are we all as strong on that as we need to be? Probably not, but we need to be. And Because that's the lo- example Jesus has shown for us, his love. We continue reading in verse 14. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of glory, we see. He's full of grace, we all know this. He's also full of truth. Truth resides in Jesus Christ. He didn't just come to make us feel good. He came so we could know the truth. So we could know the right path. We live in a world that minimizes what truth is. But Jesus was full of truth. He is the truth. We're in verse 15. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me. For he, for he was before me. Jesus physically was younger than John the Baptist, but John knew the truth. Jesus was from the beginning of time. Jesus was there. John understood who he was. Do we understand who he was? Sometimes, sometimes I see believers seem to have the attitude that he's just some guy you call up when you need something. Don't acknowledge him until you're in a jam, and then you better go to Jesus. But Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. We read in verse 16, And of his fullness we have all received in grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Jesus came to this earth to declare God. Jesus came to this earth to bring in the kingdom of God to this earth. I hope and pray that we're all citizens of that kingdom today. So many people nowadays have this view of Jesus as that's not full of the power that he has. 
people talk like uh, Jesus was just a good moral teacher. He was a lot more than that. He was God in the flesh. The very creator. No one has ever seen God at any time, but if you've seen Jesus Christ, guess what? You have seen him. And he bears witness. Yeah, I want to skip ahead to verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. <coughs> Jesus came because there's only one person who could take away our sins, and that was him. He knew it would be a hard road, because he's a God of justice. Anyone who thinks, well, God doesn't care about sin, it's okay whatever we do as long as you love Jesus. That wasn't Jesus' attitude. Because if that was Jesus' attitude, he has all power in heaven and earth. He could have just said, everything's forgiven, I'm throwing out the law, I'm opening up the floodgates of heaven. He could, he's God, he can do whatever he wants. But he's a just God. He doesn't go back on his word. If he said these are sins, then they're sins. But he gave us a way to be forgiven. His law still stands. It stands from age to age. It never will go away. And Jesus Christ is not going to violate his own law and say, Well, that's okay. It's okay that you lied. It's okay that you gossiped. It's okay that you murdered. It's okay that you stole. That's okay. It doesn't matter. It does matter. How much does it matter to Jesus? That he went to death to pay for your sins. Picture that. If he was this God who didn't care what you did, why is he going to the death for your sins? Why not, doesn't he just give everyone a free pass? It's not that he doesn't love us because he paid the price for them. But they still, the price still needed to be paid, didn't it? He comes to take away the sin of the world. Not to sweep it under the rug, not to ignore it, but to take it away. He wants to get the sin out. You know, Christian, when we turn back to our sins after Jesus Christ has paid the price for our sins, what we're doing is, it's a slap in the face to Jesus. He paid such a high price for your sin. And it does matter to him when we sin. It hurts him. It's an offense. Praise God for his grace and mercy. He still won't take back what he did for us. No matter how bad we are, he will not take that back. But he came to take away our sins, not to just give us free reign to do whatever of no consequence. Don't use Jesus' sacrifice for a license to sin. That's an insult to Jesus, an insult to his holy name. If he didn't care what we did, then he could have did things a totally different way. He could have thrown out, out everything. He didn't do that because he's a just God. The law matters. God's word matters. Sin matters. He's a God of justice and holiness. He wants us to be set apart. And that's not cruelty. Because I'm going to tell you something. Everything that Jesus Christ said is a sin, everything that God said is a sin... If you do it, you will destroy your life. When God made, when God said what's sin and what's not, he wasn't being mean. He wasn't trying to ruin your fun. I tell you what, every single person I'm trying to deal with that's a mess right now, it's because of sin that's made them a mess. Sin destroys, it corrupts, it kills. Sin is the most toxic and dangerous thing you can have in your life. If you have a problem with gossip today, it's not a cuddly little thing that you just hide away. You get rid of it, because it'll destroy you. It'll destroy your friendships. It'll destroy your relationships. 
if you have a problem, if you're not married and you want to have sex anyways, or you're married and you want to have sex with someone you're not married to, it is a problem. It'll destroy your life. It'll destroy your relationships. Get rid of it. Get it out of your life. God doesn't call it a sin because he wants to ruin your fun. He calls it a sin because he doesn't want you to be ruined. And God is not going to throw that law that was meant for our good out because he knows what we'll do if he gives us a clean slate. We'll destroy ourselves. We'll have a life of misery. And this earth won't be worth living in and heaven won't be worth living in by the time we're done with it. He's a God of justice because he has to be because we'll destroy ourselves if he isn't. Praise God for that love. He came to take away our sin. When he frees us from our sin, don't go back to it. It'll just destroy you. There's a reason he came to take it away. He came to set us free from our jail cells. Not for us to put ourselves right back into the cell after he unlocks it. We read in verse 30, This is he of whom I said, After me becomes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I didn't know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. John was a faithful servant who did what God told him to do. He didn't know when Jesus would come or who he'd be. But he faithfully served God, and then Jesus was revealed to him. Verse 32, And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I do not know him, but he who sent me to baptize of water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. What a powerful thing that Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. The best that John the Baptist or myself or Jeff could do is baptize with water. And there's a significance to that. We're commanded to go through that, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. But that isn't going to save you. That's an act of obedience, not an act of salvation. Jesus baptizes the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, once again, not the junior partner in the Trinity either. The Holy Spirit is the part of God that's in us today. And Jesus came, he didn't just save us and leave us to our devices. He didn't say, well, Esther, okay, you're saved, good luck. Mike, you're saved, have fun. He baptized us with the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit in us today. Because Jesus came to get rid of sin out of our lives. He came to give us life more abundant and free. And part of that is he didn't leave us alone. He didn't leave us powerless. Jesus realized that I am a miserable screw-up. So he sought to Larry-proof my life as much as possible. By leaving the Holy Spirit. Some, God is in me to tell me, Larry, that's a stupid idea. Larry, you need to remember what you read in the Bible the other day. Larry, this is beyond your capabilities, but I'll give you the power to do it. Praise God that we have the Holy Spirit in our lives to give us strength, to give us wisdom, sometimes to save us from ourselves. Praise God we have the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't come to leave us alone because Jesus' plan for us doesn't end at salvation. And so many Christians have this idea that once you're saved, Jesus is done with you. You're saved, and that's it. That's just the beginning. Jesus left his Holy Spirit in us. He wants us to have life more abundant and free. I hope and pray we want that. So I wanted to share a bit about Jesus, and this was on my heart. Actually, there was a bunch of passages on my heart, and I kind of had to narrow it down. If I wanted to preach about Jesus, I could probably go for about five hours, but I think you guys would uh, be running out in droves by that point. All you on YouTube would be tuning me out by the five-hour mark. 
so I'll spare you that. So, let's close in prayer. Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you so much for all you've done for us, Lord, and help us, Lord, we don't realize how precious you are. We minimize you. We don't even do it on purpose sometimes, but we let the cares and distractions of this world take our eyes off you. Help us to really take a look at just how powerful you are, all that you've done for us, all that you've sacrificed for us, Lord. If we truly appreciate all that you've done for us, then we won't want to live in the pleasures of the world. If we truly appreciate all that you've done for us, then even when we're discouraged, we won't be able to get too depressed because we'll know the high price you paid and that you thought we were worth it. You showed more, more love to us than we could ever be shown by anyone in our lives, Lord. Help us to truly appreciate what you've done. Help us not to have hearts of stone. Help us not to just, yeah, I know Jesus died for me, and then go about life. But help us to truly appreciate what you've done. Help us to truly give thanks for what you've done. Help us to truly live like we've had the most selfless and amazing act of love done on our behalf, because we have. Help us to live our lives in thanksgiving for the indescribable love that you have for us, Lord. And help us to share that with others, I pray. Bless us as we go here, Lord. Help us not to take you for granted this Christmas season, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.